Postdoc transformation. Postdoc transformation. Postdoc transformation. Invest in your postdoc transformation. Welcome to the weekly show for scientists leaping into business. In every episode, we are happy to recommend employers of choice for you. For your career transition, we offer customized career transition e-courses and memberships, also at graduate schools all over the world. Maybe yours too. And if your university isn't yet our customer, enroll in your free email course for career transition made simple, as linked in the show notes. I'm your host, Professor Dr. Anna Sui Winkles, and let's build your postdoc transformation with this episode. Ten career tips for doctoral candidates in their final year. Wow, this is a roundup of what I wish I had known during my PhD, but as a 2023 edition, and it has been demanded by some of my listeners. So here we go. For new listeners, I want to quickly remind you on the importance of the vision of life beyond your doctorate. Why? Because knowing your vision of life can make you invest. Wisely into your doctorate in your final year, and you know if you're unclear about your vision of life, please listen to episode one: How to check your readiness to leap out of science, which is question number eight out of fifteen. Tip number one: Stay focused and disciplined. Staying focused and disciplined in your final year is crucial to completing your PhD successfully. And you know it can be easy to become overwhelmed by the sheer amount of dissertation-related work that needs to be done. I get it, but setting realistic goals and deadlines for yourself can help you stay on track. Break down your work into manageable tasks and make a schedule that works for you. Everyone else. Has different priorities than you, and that's why you need to have a schedule that works for you. Capitalize on your research and teaching experience. Can you batch or cluster similar or related activities so that you can reduce ramp up and down times? Do you know at what times of the day or week you can do deep work versus light work? It's important to avoid procrastination and distractions, as they can eat into your productivity and make it more difficult to meet your deadlines. You know, try to eliminate distractions by turning off your phone, logging out of social media, and finding a quiet workspace where you can focus on your work. Like I just do now, I have the silent mode so that no one, you know, can disrupt me when I record this episode for you. Making steady progress towards your goals is also important. Even if you can only work on your dissertation for a few hours a day, make sure that you use that time effectively. And here's my pro tip, which I also share with all my bachelor and master students in real life: plan only eighty percent of your time budget, so that you have wiggle room for doing unexpected fun things or things you have to do. So that you can avoid burnout, and as a leader, do the same. Your team will be grateful and work happily for you, even if the going gets tough. But back to your dissertation, don't put off tasks until the last minute, as this can lead to a lot of stress and anxiety. Reverse engineer your schedule towards a certain goal from the deadline backwards, and that's really a pro tip because I do that this always, and it always works for me. By staying focused and disciplined, you'll be able to meet your deadlines, produce high quality work, and finish your PhD with confidence. Remember, it's the discipline and focus you cultivate during your PhD that will help you succeed. In your postdoc career and beyond, tip number two: seek feedback regularly. Well, here's my warning first, which I also share with my bachelor and master students in real life. Whether you get constructive feedback depends on the agenda of your feedback giver. If you are a threat for that person, even if you even if you don't know that, you won't get any. 
or just unhelpful or even toxic feedback. So as a PhD student, seeking feedback regularly is one of the most important practices to adopt. Feedback is essential for the successful completion of your PhD program as it helps you to identify areas where you need to improve and make necessary adjustments. No one can do this on its own, you know, but feedback can help you to avoid mistakes and improve the quality of your research. And there are several ways to seek feedback, including from your supervisor, your peers, or other experts in your field. Your supervisor is your primary source of feedback and, and is responsible for guiding your research project. He, she, or it can provide, can provide constructive criticism and guidance on how to improve your work. And, you know, it is important to maintain open communication with your supervisor before you really need it and to seek feedback regularly so that you can create and nurture a relationship that also, you know, can be, uh, I don't know, strained when you need it, so to speak. You should, you should also be receptive to their feedback and take it into consideration when making revisions. Peers and other experts in your field can also provide valuable feedback depending on their, you know, maturity level. Attending conferences or workshops where you can present your work and receive feedback from other researchers can be very helpful. And these conferences, by the way, don't have to be on site or on premise or in person, but they can also be virtual. And this can give you the opportunity to get feedback from a wider audience and to gain insights from experts in your field. It can also help you to build connections and collaborate with other researchers, which I will um, come back to later. In conclusion, seeking feedback regularly is an essential practice and skill for PhD students. It helps you to identify areas where you need to improve and make necessary adjustments and so that you can produce high quality research. And again, avoid toxic leaders. They only serve themselves. Some themselves. Um, however, even if you are lucky to have good leaders, I also encourage my bachelor and master students in real life to become independent of feedback as soon as possible, because then you don't have to rely on their goodwill or luck. And did you know that I offer deep dive e-courses, workshops and memberships at graduate schools, maybe also at yours in the future? Ask your graduate school coordinator whether they want to book my services so that I can deliver them to you 24-7, 365 on your mobile device. Tip number three, network strategically. Networking can play a critical role in your academic career, both during your PhD and beyond. So one of the key things to networking effectively is to start early so that you have time to build strong relationships with other researchers in your field. Begin by identifying key research whose work aligns with your interests and make an effort to connect with them. They will be probably happy to connect. Attending conferences is an excellent way to meet other researchers and to learn about the latest research in your field, which can be exciting. And make sure to take advantage of opportunities to network at conferences, such as attending social events, you know, grabbing a coffee, grabbing lunch together, and or even participating in post sessions, but that's, you know, that's more effort, obviously. Joining professional societies is another way to build your network. And these societies often have events, workshops, and other activities that can help you connect with other researchers in your field. And, um, well, I'd be really happy if you can also comment in social media the professional societies that you, uh, you know, enjoy. You can also volunteer um, or consider volunteering if you have time. I don't know. Um, but you can also serve on committees 
within the institutions to expand your network and develop your skills. I have to say that this is usually unpaid work. And um, well, I, I have really a strong opinion on what is valuable should also be paid. So you can do this and gain your network or gain a broader network, but you shouldn't do this for all your PhD time being unpaid. And finally, remember that networking is not just about building a large number of contacts. It's also about, you know, honing or cultivating meaningful relationships with other researchers who can provide advice, support and opportunities throughout your career. And that can also, you know, pay off, so to speak, years later. And the, the, you need this, especially if you have toxic leaders in your vicinity. Okay, then you really have to network outwards. And by strategically networking, or by networking strategically, you can build a strong and supportive community of colleagues who can help you in the long run to achieve your academic and career goals. And if you want a deep dive, um, I also discuss this in my free email course, Career Transition into Business Made Simple, and also in episode three, 10 steps to transition your career into business. Tip number four, start thinking about your post PhD career early. It's never too early to start thinking about your post PhD career, never too early. In fact, the earlier to start, the better prepared you are to pursue and to see, not only to pursue, but seeing is first, to see the opportunities that interest you most. And that's why I'm so happy that even master students from all over the world are following me on Instagram um, at Postdoc Transformation. One of the very first steps you can take into, you know, start exploring different career paths is that you check in on your own skills and interests attend career fairs and conferences and check out job postings that get to get a sense of the skills and experiences that employers are looking for. And that is not like, you know, you have to have that by the time you apply. You can also have only like 70 or 80% of that, but it actually gives you a rough orientation of the skills that you want to develop if you don't have them right away at the moment. And once you have identified potentially nonlinear career paths, start reaching out to professionals in those fields to learn more about them, um, um, the tasks, their roles, their responsibilities, their, you know, their caveats, uh, via informational interviews. And, um, again, I refer you to the episode three, how to transition your career into business, because I also talk in there and also in the email course about information interviews. And if you have someone you want to ask for an information interview, let me know because I could do that for you and interview that person in a future episode. All right. So, and related to that is episode four on the future of work for new PhD holders in business. You can also consider participating in internships, and that really depends on the country whether that is possible, or other experiential learning opportunities to gain hands-on experience in your desired field of business. And these experiences can help you develop the skills and connections you need to succeed in your post-PhD career. Finally, make sure to build a strong professional network throughout your PhD program. Connect with colleagues, mentors, and professionals in your field, but also outside of your field through conferences, social media, and other networking opportunities. And these people can provide valuable support and guidance as you navigate your postdoc. And now it's time to thank Company ABC, who sponsors this episode of the Postdoc Transformation Show. I would now be reading the company's answers to one of six bold questions so that you can choose to apply. For example, number one, describe your most valuable experts versus leaders in your company. Have they typically earned a doctor title? Or number two, for which of your company roles or units do you encourage somebody with a doctor title to apply? Number three, how would you describe your organizational culture in which your most valuable experts and leaders thrive in? 
to nominate an employer of choice so that we can ask our informative, bold questions, click on the link in the show notes. And now, back to the postdoc transformation episode. Tip number five, develop transferable skills. Do you know yours? Well, I mentioned them in episode one, how to check your readiness to leap out of science. And while technical skills are essentially for success in your field, developing transferable monetizing skills is equally important. And if you don't know them, transferable skills are skills that you can apply to a wide range of situations in careers, such as, you know, communication, project management and leadership, etc. And one way to develop these skills is by seeking out opportunities to practice them. For example, if you have the opportunity to teach a course or lead a project, take advantage of that. These experiences can help you build your communication and leadership skills, as well as your ability to manage complex tasks and work effectively with others. Um, Volunteering. Um, not that long, you know, but volunteering can also be an excellent way to develop transferable skills. Nonprofit organizations often need volunteers to help with tasks such as event planning, fundraising and outreach, which can provide opportunities for you to develop project management, communication and leadership skills. Finally, don't overlook the value of workshops, courses and other training opportunities paid programs in developing your transferable skills and many universities and uh, you know organizations um, societies offer courses in communication project management and also other key skills that can help you to stand out in your academic and also professional applications Um, by developing transferable skills you'll be better equipped to navigate the many challenges and opportunities that will, and I promise that, arise through your career. You will always be able to draw on your transferable skills. And these skills can help you to become, you know, unique and competitive. Tip number six, publish your work. And in other words, finish what you want to leave. I also discussed this in episode one, how to check your readiness to leave out of science. Publishing your research is an essential part of establishing yourself as a researcher and advancing your career. And it demonstrates your expertise in your field and can open up also opportunities for collaboration and funding. And when you prepare to publish your work, start early and work closely with your supervisor or mentor because they have the experience that you still lack maybe. And together, you can identify the most appropriate journals or conferences for your research and develop a strategy for preparing and submitting your manuscripts. And remember, identifying the most appropriate journal is depending on whether you want to stay in science or not. Remember, or, you know, a business recruiter or hiring manager or your future leader in business, they aren't able to appreciate the impact factors that maybe your principal investigator appreciates. So make sure to carefully review the submission guidelines for each journal or conference you are considering as they can vary significantly. I lost a lot of time in not attending these guidelines. So I want you to pay close attention to formatting requirements, citation style and word limits. Of course, uh, 2008 or 2005 to 8 was really a different time today. But, you know, I just want to mention that. In addition, consider seeking feedback on your manuscript from colleagues or other researchers in your field. And this can help you refine your ideas and improve the quality of your writing. And, uh, you know... The publication process can be lengthy, so be prepared for potential delays or rejections. And don't be discouraged if your work is not accepted on the first try, it happens to the best. Use the feedback you receive to revise and improve your manuscript for future submissions. And again, you know, feedback depends on the agenda. If one of the reviewers is not you know, supported by your research, then that explains why 
you have maybe obstacles in there. Okay, and I'm, I'm not questioning this. I just want to let you know. By publishing your work, you can establish yourself as a respected researcher in your field and increase your chances of success in your academic career. Again, if you want to stay in academia. So this being said, if you plan to leap into business after your doctorate, you can rather relax. Yes, you will have psychological you know, closure if you publish everything and leave science thereafter. But essentially, most business recruiters can't and won't appreciate your research publications in the way that you probably want it, especially if you apply you know, for a job unrelated to your research. And once you have determined your readiness to leap and you think, yes, this is the way forward, I want to transition into business or industries, then you can, if you like, enroll in your free email course with 10 actionable, bingeable email lessons until you start your job in business. You'll get 10 emails that detail number one, how to leap out of science, number two, how to build your sustainable LinkedIn profile, number three, how to read social media and network, number four, how to research your favorite jobs and employers, number five, how to do information interviews to get insights, number six, how to create your customized applications, number seven, how to prepare your thesis from a business point of view, Number eight, how to apply to your favorite employers. Number nine, how to choose the right job offer. And number 10, how to prepare for your new job. Woohoo! Tip number seven, attend conferences and workshops. Attending conferences and workshops is an essential part of the professional development for doctoral candidates. And I know this has been, you know, seized, so to speak, during the lockdown. But... Even the virtual ones, to some extent, provide a unique opportunity to meet and network with other researchers in your field. Share your research and learn about the latest trends and developments. To make the most of these events, it's essential to plan ahead. Look for conferences and workshops that align with your research interests and professional goals. I mean, to be honest, I always chose them because they were in a country where I wanted to make a holiday or do a holiday and make sure to register early to take advantage of the early bird discounts and other perks. Consider presenting a poster or giving a talk at the conference to showcase your research and receive feedback from your researchers. And actually, this was always the prerequisite. I was only, you know, I was only paid to go to a conference if I was able to give a poster presentation or something like that. So I think it's a give and take thing. You know, you promote your lab outside, they pay you to give their, um, you know, that talk. This can be a valuable experience that helps you refine your ideas and improve the quality of your work. And in addition to presenting your research, make sure to attend other sessions and workshops that interest you. Don't go there just for yourself. Take advantage of the opportunities to learn about new colleagues new techniques, approaches in your field, connect with others so that, you know, maybe in a couple of years time, you can reach out to them because you know that they have been doing research in that field. And finally, don't take, um, don't take it just for granted that they are there and they will reach out to you. But instead, you have to do the active connecting with other re- attendees and presenters. And that's, why it's so important that you have, you know, a business card or your LinkedIn profile um, as a QR code to share so that you can share contact information to stay in touch after the conference. These connections can lead to valuable collaborations, mentorship opportunities. In my case, I even got a postdoc opportunity and um, other job offers down the road. So... If you need a free business card template in Canva, you can check out um, the free email course, Career Transition Made Simple. I'll link to that in the show notes and then you can download that within the email course. Tip number eight, apply for funding and awards. As a doctoral candidate, applying for funding and awards can be an excellent way to gain valuable research experience and visibility as a leader in your field. 
Funding can help you support your research, obviously cover conference travel costs and also provide valuable networking opportunities. And you can find them by, you know, asking your supervisor or departmental advisors. And also, you know, there's something like Google, <laughs> you know, uh, find relevant funding sources so that you can seek out um, previous winners or previous, you know, there, there's always someone who can help you, guide you preparing a strong application. And when applying for funding or awards, it's essential to review the application guidelines and requirements. Again, that could be a time hole or rabbit hole, so to speak. Make sure to tailor your application to the specific funding opportunity, highlighting, highlighting the relevance of your research and your qualifications. Um, additionally, make sure to emphasize your achievements and accomplishments to date. And that includes your research publications, conference presentations and any volunteer or teaching experience. And while I'm talking about this, you can also um, check out my episode five, which was about chat GPT and job application. And I think that you could also tweak those prompts I mentioned for applying for a grant, so to speak. So again, remember that applying for funding and awards can be a competitive process, so make sure to prepare a strong application, maybe use ChatGPT, and give yourself plenty of time to gather all necessary materials. And talking from, you know, a business perspective, this also builds your business acumen, as you will be probably responsible to manage the awarded funding. And if you are able to report your research outcomes to the public, this will also sharpen your scientific communication and public relations skills. Hey, have you found this episode so far helpful for yourself? Well, maybe you can subscribe and also share this episode with your PhD bestie because that would encourage us to help the underprivileged, underrepresented and underserved early career scientists leaping into business. And now back to the show. Tip number nine, consider alternative career paths. Well, hopefully this is no surprise, right? So we create weekly content for you so that you can manage your postdoc transformation. And while an academic career may be the most traditional and most logical post PhD path, it's also the less common one. So it's essential to consider alternative career paths that align with your skills and interests. There are many rewarding career options outside of academia, including industry, business, government, nonprofit, and entrepreneurship. To explore alternative career paths, start by attending career fairs or networking events. And these events can provide an excellent opportunity to meet professionals in different fields and learn more about their career paths. Um, it doesn't have to be a full blown informational interview. It's just, it can also be just chatting with them over a coffee. And you can also reach out to an alumni or uh, from your program or professionals in your desired field, um, again, for information interviews. But I, like I said, um, if you want to reach out to someone, let me know. Maybe I can help you with that. And when exploring alternative career paths, make sure to consider the skills and experiences required for success in each field. Um, so, for example, if you're interested in industry or business, you may need to develop skills in project management, teamwork and communication. You have to have business acumen, right? So similarly, if you are interested in government, you may need to have experience in Brussels, so to speak, or in other, you know, um, with you know, so um, policy development and analysis. Remember that exploring alternative career paths can take time, so be patient and persistent. Consider taking on volunteer or internship opportunities in your desired field for a limited time frame to gain experience and make valuable connections. Overall, considering alternative career paths can help you find the fulfilling career that you 
deserve. And again, listen to episode three: How to transition your career into business. If information interviews are and the purpose and how you can go about it is unclear to you. And cue the confetti. Behind the scenes, I have already secured a couple of information interviews behind the scenes for season two. So. Let me know who else I shall interview for you. Number ten: Take care of yourself. Well, the final year of your PhD program can be intense and demanding time with long hours of research, writing, and deadlines. And it's important for you to take care of yourself during this time because no one else will. You need to ensure that you can stay focused and perform at your best. And one of the most important things you can do is to prioritize your physical and mental health. Make time for regular exercises, whether that's through a gym membership, running if you don't have the money, or simply taking a walk outside if you are not able to run. Eating a balanced diet, staying hydrated, and getting enough sleep are also critical to maintaining. You know your energy levels and reducing stress. And I know that if you are a parent, that's like ridiculous. But I'd also beg you to: you cannot be a good parent if you cannot, you know, care for your kid because you are so asleep, you are so tired, and as such. So it's the same situation. Make the dissertation your baby as well, and then you probably will find a way. It's equally important to take breaks when you need them, and I I'm a psychologist. I cannot overemphasize this too few too little. You know, you don't have to be working all the time to be productive. Especially with ChatGPT, think about things that maybe you can you know outsource or do differently because you maybe have some tech available. Right. So I mean, I remember that my mom. She also became a doctor, and she used a typewriter that you had to manually use. So that generation also did a PhD,、uh, but didn't have a computer. Now my generation had a computer,、uh, no artificial intelligence, and your generation is the one that can boost your productivity with AI. So why not use that? And you need to be working more efficiently in the long run, and then maybe this is this experience with AI will also help you、um, finding the jobs in business that are certainly also drawing on AI, not just in the near future, already today. And consider taking short breaks throughout the day, so not just one big break in the middle, like after four. Hours or so, but instead you should have like one one break after sixty or ninety minutes. You should also go for a walk, listening to music or chatting with a friend, and that's why I also record a podcast without the video as the the primary source of information. So I'm hoping that you are listening to this episode,、um, to this show. While you're doing some chores, while you're doing the household chores, while you are walking outside or commuting,、uh, commuting, sorry, so that you don't lose time while you are gaining valuable insights in this show. And if you experience stress and anxiety, which I can only imagine, consider mindfulness、um, practices such as meditation or yoga. Talk. About this with your friends, chances are quite high that you are not alone. And if that is not enough, and、uh, your family can't help you, your friends can't help you, you need to seek out and reach out to a mental health professional if you're struggling. This is not meant to be a path to, you know, mental deterioration. The PhD is meant to make you a better person, a better professional. So let's recap each advice. Number one, stay focused and disciplined. Number two, seek feedback regularly. Number three, network strategically. Number four, start thinking about your post PhD career early. It doesn't have to be a postdoc because I became a professor at an applied university without a postdoc. 
Number five, develop transferable skills. Number six, publish your work. Number seven, attend conferences and workshops. Number eight, apply for funding and awards. Number nine, consider alternative career paths. And number ten, take care of yourself. So, in closing, I want you to remember that you will be able to manage your postdoc transformation. And with this episode, I hope that you can invest into your doctorate, especially in your last year, according to your vision of life. Thank you for listening. Please share and subscribe to the weekly postdoc transformation show. Do you want the transcript of our episode and our episode sponsors' answers to all six bold questions so that you can choose to apply? Do you want to nominate your employer of choice so that we can ask them our bold questions? For all of that, check out our clickable links in our show notes. And on our website, www.postdoctransformation.com, you can also check your readiness to leap into a business or enroll in our free email course, Career Transition Made Simple. Thanks for your attention. I'm Professor Dr. Elna Sui Winkles, the host of your weekly postdoc transformation show. Postdoc transformation, postdoc transformation, postdoc transformation.